Let's read the scriptures. John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would he have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Let us pray. Father, we do praise you for your word that comes to us in all its freshness and authoritativeness. Give us understanding, we pray. Discipline our imagination. But above all, we ask that you will reveal to our hearts again this morning who the Son of God is, his supremacy, his uniqueness, and grant us a right response to what we understand. For we pray it for the sake of the glory of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, when I was a child... I learned that if I sat on the shoulders of my father, I could see further than he could. And in the things of God and in the understanding of Scripture, I come to these talks dependent on greater minds than mine, on greater hearts than mine, and those who have shared in the past. So I want to talk just for a moment about my sources. Many, many books have been written about the Gospel of John through the centuries from which I have profited. But there are two in particular that have been my constant companions. The first is the magisterial volume by my co-speaker, Don Carson, on the Gospel of John. Its insights have been of enormous benefit to me showing me many things that I just missed. How couldn't I have seen that? But I hadn't. And then my friend and mentor, Professor David Gooding, who's now in his late 80s, and for 50 years I've worked together with him. He wrote a book called In the School of Christ, which is enormously helpful with its insights and its warmth as it discusses the upper room ministry that we are about to approach. And in that connection, let me give you all a present. Because David Gooding's books have been, A, reprinted under the title Myrtlefield House. But if you can't afford to buy them, you can have them free. All you need to do is Google keybibleconcepts.com keybibleconcepts.com and you can download them in many different languages. So there's a little free gift for you. But I would particularly recommend to you his last book, which is The Riches of Divine Wisdom, How the New Testament Uses the Old, which I believe will be a rich resource for many years to come for people who find some of the passages in the New Testament difficult as they refer to equally difficult passages in the Old Testament. Now our task today is to think 
about our Lord's famous statement, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Its global context is, of course, the Gospel of John, whose stated purpose is, as we saw in my first talk, that we come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, we receive life in his name. But the more immediate context is the Lord's final teaching to his disciples in Jerusalem on the eve of his crucifixion. Sin had brought ugliness, alienation into the world to such an extent that when God became human and visited his own planet and people, they did not in the main receive him. And in the end, they murdered him. And yet, such is the wisdom and loving grace of God that he turned that evil deed into the supreme redemptive act that alone could deal with the damage that sin had caused. There were some who did receive him. Men like Peter, James, John, the other disciples. Women like Mary, Martha, Joanna. They were attracted to him. To his purity, integrity, wisdom and love. Like those disciples at Cana of Galilee, they caught a glimpse of his glory and knew instinctively that he, above all others, was utterly, uniquely to be trusted as the Messiah and Son of God. And Jesus began a journey with them and undertook the task of transforming them by his teaching, his example, and his power, the supreme example of which is found in these chapters. It transpired in an unknown house in Jerusalem in a borrowed upstairs room. They often think of the unnamed person who lent Christ and his disciples his home. What awesome things happened under that roof for those few hours. The setting is given in 13.1. It was just before the Passover festival and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Passover celebrated the great exodus of Israel from Egypt, their deliverance from the power and the domination of Pharaoh, to be free to worship God according to their conscience and God's leading, and to start a journey. On that Passover Eve to start a journey that would lead them ultimately to the promised land under the leadership of Moses. But before that deliverance could be realized then and the journey begin, the Passover had to be celebrated because Israel had to learn, as people have to learn today, that political deliverance is not enough. Men and women are sinners and therefore need to be delivered from the wrath of God due to their sin. If the problem of human sin is not dealt with, then those today who are set politically free from oppression are in danger of becoming tomorrow's tyrants. A religious festival could not, of course, accomplish that which needed to be accomplished, which is why Passover feast pointed forward to what happened at the cross. The problem did not lie between animals and God, and so no mere lamb could deal with the problem. But Passover projected its light up through history, and now the reality was about to occur in Jerusalem, to which the ancient festival had pointed. Now was about to happen the supreme sacrifice of the Lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world and deliver his people from no mere Pharaoh, but from the prince of this world, the enemy, the arch enemy of God and oppressor of his people, 
who lurks ever more prominently in the shadows of those final hours in Jerusalem. This was going to be a bigger deliverance by far than the exodus from Egypt. It was an exodus, which means going out. And you see Jesus in chapter 13, verse 1, he's thinking about going out to the Father. Utterly supernatural, of course. There is another world, ladies and gentlemen. This is not the only world that exists. And now, as the final hours crowd together where the realities are going to be on center stage, we're thinking of our little planet, not as a closed system, but one in it who is the Son of God who's about to take an exodus and go out and pioneer the very same journey for those who trust him. Jesus knew he was about to leave. His mind was full of the wonder and glory of it, going to the Father. And we cannot begin to conceive what that means. The harmony that is God, the fellowship that is God, And in the next few hours, something was going to happen that our minds cannot begin to understand. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And all we can do is bow our heads and worship. And the Lord knew that that was the path for him back to the Father. Notice he's not talking about going back to the Father's house. He's talking about going back to the Father. He's talking about the fellowship that he had enjoyed for all eternity. And yet, with his mind full of the glory of being with the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. His disciples were not an afterthought. It was with his mind full of the expectation of glory, simultaneously, He was going to demonstrate what the uttermost love actually meant. He had to pioneer the journey. It would involve, like no other, death, burial, resurrection, ascension. The prince of this world was actively at this point engineering in the heart of Judas a betrayal. But God would turn his act of utter defiance and rebellion into the very means of liberating The power that the disciples would need ultimately to spread their message of salvation, peace and freedom. But first, he must pioneer that journey in a manner in which no others could follow. And so he turns to prepare his disciples for his departure and for their journey. And it's not simply a geographical or a space journey. It's a journey into fellowship with him ever more deeply. It's a journey of transformation of character through the power of God's spirit that Christ would leave with them. It's a journey into increasing devotion to the Lord and increasing affection with him. He was going to teach them what it meant for him to love them to the end so that they would get the central heart of his message, which is a relationship. The teachings in two parts. At the end of John 14, Jesus says, Rise, let us go from here. Now, of course, as you know, when we have guests in our homes, it often happens that they say, Let's go. And then sometimes, to our chagrin, they sit down for another hour or three, when we were hoping to get to bed, and they don't go. Well, if we presume that the Lord did get up at the end of chapter 14, then the second half of his teaching about the true vine took place outside, perhaps as they walked through the vineyards. Whether they were inside or not, the tone changes. Because in 15 and 16, the Lord turns to prepare his disciples for the immense task of bearing fruit outside in a hostile world. There's an inside and there's an outside. 
And our task is briefly to consider the inside preparation for the outside witness. Let's get this into our minds. It's two things. All that transpired inside was to get them so close to him that they'd have the courage outside to witness effectively to what he'd done in them and for them. Now the inside story has several elements. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He exposes Judas' treachery. He exposes Peter's weakness. And then he tells in chapter 14 the disciples about his provision for them to achieve the goal of their salvation. Thirteen people were in the room. Jesus and the twelve he had chosen. One of them in process of finalizing his intention to betray the Lord. And before the night was over, he would sell him for 30 pieces of silver. Another, Peter, was strong in his protestations of loyalty to Jesus. Yet within 24 hours, he would publicly deny Jesus three times. And as for the rest, they would forsake him and flee when they saw he did not resist arrest. And yet, He, who had no illusions about them, as we shall see, was going to so transform 11 of these men that we would be sitting here today. They would courageously take the gospel throughout the world to such an extent that we can sit today and marvel at the grace and the power of God's Spirit That led them to it. So in that upstairs room in Jerusalem. He set about shaping their characters. Preparing them for their mission. And the very first lesson arose out of the fact. That there was apparently no servant there. To perform the simple customary task of washing guests feet. After their dusty walk through the city. And Jesus did of it. None of the disciples apparently thought of it. And it was profoundly embarrassing when the Lord came to wash Peter's feet. And Peter says, you're not going to do that, Lord. And Jesus said, if I don't do it, you know, you have no part with me. Notice the preposition. It's not no part in me. It's Peter, if you want to be with me in the job of reaching the world, in the job of developing inner holiness and sanctification, you've got to allow me to do this. But then he translated it into a completely different level. Because Peter suddenly realizing that what was at stake was the witness, being with the Lord, he said, oh, wash me all over, Lord. Not necessary, said Christ. Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. So our Lord translates it up into the spiritual level. The picture is clear, of course. In the ancient world, they didn't have, unless you were unbelievably wealthy, you didn't have your own bathroom. You went down to the public baths to have a bath. And if you were going out for dinner, you'd go down and have a public bath. You were washed all over. And then you walked through the dusty streets of the city and you came to your host's door and there would be a servant at the door to wash your feet. And then you'd be completely clean. That's the idea. But the Lord uses it at a much deeper level. He's talking about spiritual and moral cleanness. You are clean, but not all. What did he mean? Well, the scripture elsewhere talks and uses the metaphor of washing at two distinct levels, doesn't it? Titus chapter 3 verse 5 talks about God's fundamental provision for dealing with our character. The washing of regeneration. That doesn't come through our works, says Paul. So that's the fundamental thing that never needs to be repeated. 
when we trust Christ, we receive eternal life, which is by definition eternal. And I'll come to that in a moment. Thereafter, afterwards, we need to allow Christ to wash our hands and our feet. We don't have to become regenerate again, to be bathed all over. But we do need to allow Christ to do it. How does he do it? Well, do you remember those verses in Ephesians where it talks to husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church? It talks there about the washing of water with the word. And the word for washing, lutron in Greek, refers to the ancient laver in the temple of the tabernacle. And it's a brilliant illustration, you know, because if you look back into Exodus, that laver at which they washed their feet, the priests in Israel were washed all over first, never repeated. Then daily they washed their hands and their feet in the laver. But the interesting thing about the laver was it was made out of mirrors. The mirrors the women used to organize their faces. And some men use them these days as well. So when they looked into the labor, they saw themselves. It's such a brilliantly simple illustration, isn't it? Because the operation of Christ's cleansing is the washing of water with the word. We look into the word, it's like a mirror, says James, and we see ourselves. And it pushes to the surface the bits of dirt. And Christ wishes us to repent and take them away. That's the constant process. Washing all over, never repeated. But the wonderful genius of God is, he gives us his Holy Spirit to live within us. He gives us his word outside of us. And as we look into it, it acts like a mirror. And it shows us what needs to be done. And so our Lord is teaching them about cleansing. The cleansing that's necessary to be involved in his great mission. And he comes then to the exposure of Judas, a powerful symbolic act that exposes not only who the traitor was, but the nature of his sin. One that eats my bread, lifts up his heel against me. Now just think carefully what's that saying. Lifting up the heel against someone That's kicking them once you're past them. They don't see you coming. You sort of lift your heel. That's a nasty way of getting someone to crash, isn't it? It's more honest to come and kick them in the front, isn't it? And Judas was going to kick with a backflash of his foot the one who'd given him the bread to eat. And this sop of friendship, as I understand it in Middle Eastern courtesy, if you were entertaining a group of people to dinner, you might, in the middle of the dinner, you as a host hold out a sop. You take a lump of bread and you dip it in the wine and you'd hold it out and you'd put your hand in the middle of the table. Anybody could take it. And if there was someone sitting there desperate to get your friendship, he might reach out and take it as a genuine offer of friendship. Now this is very profound and it's very moving to me. Judas had been taking Christ's bread for years. He'd been taking everything from Christ. He was control of the finances. But the thing he'd never taken was Christ's friendship. He'd taken the gifts without the giver. And this is analyzing the heart of what scripture means by worldliness. It's taking the gifts without the friendship of the giver. And my, how good we all are at doing it, I fear. This wicked heart in me. And it's almost as if the Lord is saying, Judas, if a little bit more bread will help, take it, man. And in utter insincerity, he took it. And you read the grim words, then Satan entered into him. 
Did Christ mean it genuinely? Of course. That raises all kinds of theological problems, but since I'm not a theologian, I'm not going to try and deal with them. <laughs> Just accepting it as face value. This is dramatic, ladies and gentlemen. They were at a Passover feast. They were eating together. There's so much about eating in the New Testament. But the Lord is exposing Judas for several reasons. Of course, one of them is that it was very important that the other disciples knew that Judas would betray him. Otherwise, the impression might have been given subsequently that Judas had succeeded in deceiving him and that the Lord was incapable of telling the difference between a genuine apostle and a false one. Because, of course, the contrast in this chapter is between the exposure of Judas and the exposure of Peter. And we need to ask the question, what difference is there between them? One betrayed the Lord, the other denied the Lord. What is going on. But first, the essence of sin is taking the gifts. He that takes my bread, notice the word my. He owns it all, the cornflakes you ate this morning. Ultimately, they're his cornflakes. He gave them to you. It's good to say thanks at meals, isn't it? I remember once, have you ever done that? You're sitting in a restaurant far from home and you wonder, should I close my eyes or does it look ridiculous? I was in Israel, in the most orthodox university in the place as a visiting professor, and I decided I'd close my eyes. It was all my own in a corner. Three minutes later, it had tapped the shoulder. And a man said, can I sit down and talk to you? I said, please do. He said, you're not a Jew, are you? I said, actually, I'm not. I said, how did you know? He said, you were praying, weren't you? I said, I was. He said, do you believe in God? Do you think he's real? And for the next two hours, he poured out the tragedy of his life, simply because I closed my eyes. Now, I wouldn't be legalistic about it. But there are times, aren't there, where that simple act of giving thanks, because we live in a thankless world, And we need to pay attention to the actual diagnosis here because it's so important. The sin is taking the world without Jesus. Is taking his bread, his wealth, his talents and having no space for him. And that's telling us on the flip side that the essence of holiness is devotion to him. It's spending time with him. It's enjoying his fellowship. It's allowing him to develop that relationship with us. And failure to understand this, of course, has sometimes led people to think that holiness consists in adopting legalistic practices, wearing antiquated clothes, keeping all kinds of rigid codes of comfort. And yet at heart, There may be no space or love for the Lord. Of course, it's also sadly possible to study Holy Scripture, isn't it? As a mere profession or hobby, preferring sermons for others and yet not seeking the personal friendship of Christ. That's the first thing to go. The story of Judas warns us that it is possible to appear to be a genuine preacher, and yet for sake of position, power, or gain to be disloyal to Christ morally, spiritually, intellectually, and therefore theologically. The sin that is the opposite of holiness is a virulent poison. There was something glorious, as is pointed out, about our Lord's genuine offer of the sop of friendship. A glorious thing. And now Jesus begins to talk to him and he allows Judas to leave. And he said, what you're about to do, do quickly. And no one understood what he was saying and they thought that Jesus was telling him to buy something for the festival or to give something for the, to the poor. That's staggering. Can you imagine what tone of voice our Lord would have used to tell a disciple to give something to the poor? That was the tone of voice he used 
to the betrayer. Oh, what a lesson for us who so readily get angry. This is magnificent. This is evidence of what it means to be the Son of God because this transcends our mere pathetic humanities. This is real godliness because this is God. And Jesus reminds them that he's going away. Verse 33, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. This wasn't a new topic. Indeed, sometime before at the festival of tabernacles in Jerusalem, as John records it, a group came to arrest him and he informed them that he was going to leave them anyway. Almost as if to say, there's no point in arresting me because I'm leaving. Yet a little while I am with you, he said on that occasion, and then I go unto him that sent me. You shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am you cannot come. And they were, of course, utterly mystified, and they thought he was going on a lecturing tour among the Jews of the dispersion. They had no idea that just as his entry into the world had been unique, he didn't start in this world. The one who is the word incarnate didn't start at Bethlehem. He never started in that absolute sense. In the beginning, the word already was eternal, co-eternal with the Father. And they hadn't a ghost of a notion that just as he'd come into the world, so he was going to leave the world. No idea that he was talking about the cross, the resurrection, the ascension. But now the disciples had to grasp it. They couldn't yet follow as he told them. But he had a new commandment for them to love one another even as he had loved them. The commandment to love one another wasn't new. Even as he loved them was very new. Remember the text that stands at the beginning, he loved them to the end. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another, even as I have loved you. And his love was utterly unique, as they would soon see, as he hung for them on a cross, bearing their sin. Never had there been love like this, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. And yet they were weak men. Was it realistic of him to expect that anything could be done? They were beset, like all of us, with the weaknesses of humanity that immediately come to light in the warm and very human character of Peter. Who thought he'd grasped the situation? The Lord was leaving. He wished to go. He had been washed by the Lord. And Peter saw no barrier, especially as he says, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. It's easy, isn't it, in the warmth when your Christian friends are around you to sing all kinds of devotional songs and make all kinds of promises that don't last five minutes. And Peter was no different, and that's an encouragement. He didn't know the truth about himself. But the one who is the truth was about to show him the truth about himself. And it was going to be very painful. Surely Jesus wasn't suggesting. Peter had just seen him expose Judas. I'm not like that, Lord. I'm prepared to lay down my life for you. Really? Before the rooster crows three times, you will, before the rooster, the rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. It was a question of truth. The Lord must expose the treachery of Judas. And now he must expose the weakness of Peter. Do I know about the truth about myself? Do you? Of course, none of us would claim to be perfect unless we are defending our behavior to our wives. It's amazing how perfectionism creeps in there, isn't it, gentlemen? 
And many of us are rightly resolved to serve the Lord and live for him. Yet most of us have discovered that despite our good intentions and our resolve, our resources are inadequate. And we get caught out by some totally unexpected happening. And we trip up. And the bitterness of repeated failure is something that, well, we all have to deal with, don't we? And it can lead to despair and giving up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Peter's resolve would collapse into a denial that led to bitter tears of regret. And yet Jesus had said to him, you can't follow me now, but you will follow later. He didn't say that to Judas, did he? There's a difference between a Peter and a Judas. Peter's failure would be overcome. Unlike Judas, he was a genuine believer. He'd been bathed all over. But it would need a delicate work on the behalf of the Lord to get him back on his feet. Because when the word of God approached Peter, he was looking in the mirror as he stood before Jesus. And the mirror said, you're going to deny me. He didn't believe the word of the Lord. And if you don't listen to the word of the Lord... You have to learn the lesson the hard way. Haven't we learned it frequently? It might have been different, might it not? Peter said, Lord, am I really like that? Talk to me about it, Lord. Tell me what I can do, because the last thing I want to do is to get involved in denial. But he didn't believe the word of the Lord. And so what the Lord could have exposed in the warmth of that upper room, the warmth and light of a fire had to devastate Peter's inner confidence in himself. And he denied him. And the Lord knew that he would never progress unless he faced that weakness. He thought he had enough devotion. And therefore he didn't believe what the Lord said. It's hard, isn't it? To face in me what Paul says, in my flesh there dwells no good thing. And of course, it must have been magnificent afterwards when Peter remembered that Jesus said, you will follow afterwards. Now this is very important, ladies and gentlemen. Because often traveling around as I do, I meet people who say, you know, I knew a man once and he was a fine believer. But now he says he's an atheist atheist, and he's clearly lost his eternal life. What do we do with that kind of thing? Well, of course, it's a matter of judgment, isn't it? You thought he was a fine believer. That was your judgment. You now say he's lost his eternal life. That's your judgment. You cannot settle it by your looking on the outward situation. Theoretically, there are only two possibilities. Either the man was genuine, and it is possible to lose your eternal life, or he's not genuine, and never was genuine in the first place. How will we settle that? By scripture, ladies and gentlemen. Not by our observations. Now this is vastly important. We learn in John 6, the wonderful statement of Christ. That the will of the Father for him is not to lose any one of those who's been drawn to the Father and trusted the Lord. That's magnificent, you know. Don Carson pointed it out the other night. I'm going to repeat it. If Christ loses you, he's failed to do the will of the Father if you're genuine. So I conclude from that that Judas was never genuine. And you see, the danger of the opposite view is this. That if you say to someone, well, you were a genuine believer, you had eternal life and you've lost it, you then leave them thinking that they know what the real thing is. We've got to settle it theologically. And this is one of the most magnificent doctrines in Scripture. I can remember when I grasped it as a student in Cambridge. Christ has made a provision, ladies and gentlemen, not simply for our guilt, 
not simply in giving us our Holy Spirit. He has made a provision for the maintenance of our faith. You shall follow hereafter. How could our Lord say that to Peter? Because, as Luke tells us, now I have to steal something from Luke here, but he won't mind. He turned to the disciples and he said, Satan has desired to sift you, all of you, as wheat. But I have prayed for you, singular Peter, that your faith fail not. And when you have turned established your brothers. Now, let me put it to you. You notice Christ didn't pray for Peter's testimony. It failed. He didn't prayed for Peter's control of his language. It failed. He was swearing and cursing. Christ prayed for his faith not to fail. Now, you come with me and watch Peter denying the Lord. And as he's swearing and cursing, I say to you, is that man a believer? Watch what your answer is. When the cock crew... And Peter wept bitterly. It was not the weeping of a lost man. It was the weeping of a sheep who'd learned two things. One, how far a sheep can do when he gets unrealistic about his commitment to the Lord. And how far the shepherd is prepared to go. Those magnificent words, I have prayed for you. And here I stand today, ladies and gentlemen. And you, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believed it yesterday. But what about tomorrow? Oh, those verses have been so real to me in my life. I prayed for you, John. That your faith doesn't fail. Many other things will fail that we learn the lesson. But the Lord's not going to lose me. And he's not going to lose you if you've come to place your trust in Christ. There's a provision, not simply for our guilt, not simply for our character. There's a provision for the maintenance of our faith. It is magnificent. And it can establish you as the flow is against you. And so we move on. And we move on into the way in which this is done. Now, unfortunately, the number 14 sits in our Bibles. And we separate chapter 14 from 13. But let me read it to you as it must have sounded originally. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. What? In the same breath. He announces his weakness and his failure, and he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Why is that? Because of what I've just been saying to you. This is wonderful, and it is so encouraging. Let not your hearts be troubled. There was a lot of trouble, of course, in the room. The announcement of Judas' betrayal and his departure. The announcement of the Lord going away. The prediction of Peter's denial were enough to shake any group of men. And the Lord sees that, of course. And after telling Peter straight what he's going to do, he says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Well, how can he do that? And this is the wonder of it, of course. He knew he would restore Peter and the rest of them. The relationship would be deeper as a result of it. But he starts now to prepare them to be able to face these things by taking their minds off themselves and their own troubles and their own psychological reactions. You believe in God, he says. Believe also in me, which could mean a number of things. And I leave what I think it means until... You see it from the text itself. You believe in God. They all did. Believe in me. The same faith as you put in God, put in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms that were not so. Would I have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Away from their troubles. 
to the Father's house. That expression has been used in John for the temple in Jerusalem. But this is an infinitely bigger Father's house. This is his house in heaven. I'm going to the Father's house to prepare a place for you. It's got many rooms. It's a bit more complex than the simplistic notion some people have of it. What God's Father's house, what Jesus' Father's house is going to be like, beggar's imagination. The temple in Jerusalem had many rooms, of course, for the various things that the priests would do. But there is a world to come where you're going to have space. You're going to have a room. I'm glad I've got a room here in Sydney. And I'm not just billeted together with a whole lot of other people. Some of you are, I know that. Well, I hope you've endured it and survived it. But we find we need space, don't we? We need space. And God's going to give us space in the world to come. But forgive me, the scientist in me wants to speculate, but I'm not going to do it. Because there's so much more to be said. And where I'm going, he said, you know the way. I'm going to come again. I'm going to receive you to myself so that you may be with me. He doesn't say I'm going to take you to heaven, although it's implied. We could get to heaven, so to speak. I could go to Buckingham Palace in London and never meet the Queen. He's going to take us to the Father so that you might be with me. It's going to achieve the goal of your salvation. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas didn't. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. And the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And now he moves from the goal of the journey to the way. He's not only concerned to teach the disciples about the dwelling place. He wishes to teach them about the Father himself. And chapter 14 is devoted to unpacking the three elements of this claim. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Thomas, if you really know me, you'll know my Father. From now on you do know him and have seen him. And Philip a bit exasperated, it was too enigmatic for him, said, look, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. And what happens next is beyond my powers of description. Jesus said, Philip, don't you know me? Philip, don't you realize what's going on right now? I've been a long time among you. Don't you realize, Peter, that, Philip, that anybody who's seen me has seen the Father? How could you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? The very words I'm speaking now, Philip, they're coming from the Father. You're sitting next to him. Oh, it's awesome, ladies and gentlemen. As these humble men discovered they'd reached the Father, he was sitting across the table in front of them. Don't you realize what's going on? It was an awesome moment. This is now the climax of What John said in his first chapter, the only begotten Son of the Father, he has made him known. The Word became human. This is God sitting in the upper room, incarnate in Christ. And they suddenly, the explosion in their minds and their hearts, as they realize they've already reached the Father. Is that who you believe Jesus is? 
You see, John's gospel is designed to get us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And it's unpacking it chapter after chapter after chapter until suddenly these men who thought the Father's house, heaven, it's all distant. And suddenly the distance is swallowed up. And the Father is across the table from them. I can't get my head around that, but that is magnificent, isn't it? I'm the way. The way to a person is a person. And Christ is the way to God. I suspect they were stupefied. It's pivotal. It is climactic. But it's not the end. They were sitting across the table and when God incarnate was on earth, nobody had ever been so near to God before. But you know as well as I do, the person sitting beside you is only a few inches from you. But you could be miles apart in spirit. You don't know the truth, do you, about the person sitting next to you, nor they about you, usually. You see, in order to get to know the Father, physical proximity is wonderful, but it isn't enough. Not by a long chalk is it enough. You've got to know the truth about the Father. You've got to have the life of the Father. You see, I had a wonderful Father. I'm so grateful for it because I know many people haven't. I would know my Father better than you ever could have known him because I've got his life. And now, of course, rather than ramping down, it begins to ramp up to a level that is just inexpressible and would take me at least another two hours to explain to you. But it's probably good that I don't have the time because we just want to emphasize the big things. I am the truth. What a statement. Notice what it's not saying. He doesn't say, I say true things, although that's true. I am the truth. The truth question is one of the most fundamental questions that human beings can ask. What's the truth about a flower? Well, the truth is there are various pigments that do the colors. What's the truth about those? Well, it goes down to the biochemical level. Then it goes down to the atomic level. Then it goes down to the subatomic level. And what's the truth about those Higgs bosons and elementary particles? And as you dig down into the questions, suddenly there comes a voice and says, I am the truth. How easily we cut Jesus down to our friend kind of stuff. And he is our friend. But ladies and gentlemen, what our world needs to hear is confident assertion of what it means to claim that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the truth. He is the answer to every chain of questions. None of them go back infinitely often. Staggering claim, and of course if it isn't true, it's nonsense, as C.S. Lewis saw years ago. He'll tell you the truth about the Father, but he'll do something even bigger. He's going away, he says, I'm not going to leave you orphans. You're going to see me again. And the final point I wish to make is this. There are two kinds of dwelling place in this chapter, and we're far more interested in the first than in the second. The word money in Greek is only used here in the New Testament. In my Father's house are many abiding places. But listen to this. Verse 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. The word home is abiding place. It's all very well to say I believe that one day I'm going to an abiding place. But what about making an abiding place for the Father, the Son, and the Spirit right now in me? How does that look? And it's conditional. Do you notice that? If any man love me. It's all about love right from the very beginning. If any man love me, he will keep my commandments. And the Father and the Son are prepared to come into me. Oh, how can I ever grasp that? This is even bigger, you see. 
even bigger than what was happening at the table there. And it could only happen, as Jesus points out, by him going away to send the Spirit to bring the very life of God into the heart of human beings. Jesus is utterly unique and utterly supreme. And ladies and gentlemen, it's useful to grasp this. He doesn't compete with any other religion because no other religion offers us what he offers us. Religions have a habit of describing themselves as the way or the path, the eightfold path, the way. I am the way, said Jesus. And they tell us, as now I close, about a path that starts with a little gate, a ceremony. You get in onto the path, and then you have your gurus or priests or whatever to teach you. And then there's a big, big gate at the end with a judgment. And if you merit it, you'll get through to nirvana or heaven or whatever else it is. And as I travel around the world, I meet millions of people, even professing Christians, that think that Christianity is a way like that. It isn't. The Christian way is a person. And we get the assurance, not at the end of the way, but at the beginning of the way. Because it doesn't depend on merit. It's not like a university course. It depends on the work of Christ on the cross. And Jesus stood in this world and he said, Truly I say to you, if you hear my word and believe him that sent me, you have eternal life. You shall not come into judgment. How can he say that? Because he's the judge. And if God accepts what his son has done on the cross for you and me, we can know that we will one day be with him, not because of our merit, but because of his merit. And therefore we're set free to live for him. And as I have to tell so many people around the world, you know, I don't go around talking about God in order to gain acceptance. I do it because I've got it. I am the way, the truth, the life. How much I really believe of this will be shown by what my character looks like and how many of the spaces in my character I allow Father, Son, and Spirit to occupy. Let's pray.